Hi, I'm Andrew Hilton. I'm, for the moment, the director of the Center for the Study of Financial Innovation. I'm uh, my successor will be moving in at the beginning of March, but uh, I will still stick around in some form or another. Um, this is our regular fintech review. It's a sort of monthly meeting we've been had, we've had for uh, a number of years initially with Isabella Kaminska and subsequently with her successor at Alphaville, uh, Jemima Kelly. Jemima, I think, is uh, moving on to bigger and better things from Alphaville, but she's, as we all know, a fairly regular columnist on the FT. She sets the agenda for this, uh, but we also have people to comment on what that agenda and perhaps to say what she missed and uh, what, what is important and what is not. And I'm delighted that we have two very distinguished uh, panelists this, this month. Chris Gledhill is an independent FinTech advisor, uh, speaker and writer, who according to his website is a top global FinTech influencer, the world's top ranking authority on FinTech. Now, I have a good friend, Dave Birch, who might take exception to that, but you know, this is a crowded field. He is a former CEO at SECO, which was one of the challenger banks. He, he was head of uh, Lloyd's Innovation Lab, Lloyd's Banking Group's Innovation Lab. He worked for Tata Consultancy. He worked for Accenture. Uh, and he is, and I quote again, on a crusade to reinvent the uh, finance industry. He is the author of a book called Consumerization. And uh, I'm delighted that we have him. But uh, as I say, we also have John Salmon, who we've, uh, we've had on these panels before. He is the technology partner at Hogan Lovells uh, here in London. He's been advising on digital and tech for over 20 years. He's uh, been a partner with H Hogan Lovells for six years, educated at Edinburgh and Strathclyde. So I'm going to ask Chris and John just to tell us for two or three minutes what they're up to, and what their main concerns are, and then we get to the agenda that uh, that uh, my colleague Ophelia and uh, Jemima have been working on. So Chris, Chris Gledhill, what are you up to? Um, so I'm having a lot of fun at the moment. I'm uh, running a series of metaverse workshops uh, okay. for executives in London. So <laughs> Um, I found that there was a problem that a lot of people don't really get Metaverse and they're um, uh, reading a lot about it, but there's no substitution for actually putting on a virtual reality headset. And I give them a bit of a tour guide in the Metaverse. Uh, so I take them around the various Meta worlds, show them what, what's going on on Web3 and NFTs and kind of take them by the hand and have a bit of fun. And then I showed him kind of... With Nick Clegg will just, I, I would have thought, kill anybody. But <laughs> can, I, can I please sign up? to one of those chris Absolutely. i think i would I'll, like I'll the link yeah it is it's a lot of fun i also show people what it means to have like a, a virtuality zoom meeting so we all put on the headsets and then we gather around the whiteboard and we all interact and it's kind of it's all very clumsy but it's a lot of fun and it kind of shows people the potential of the technology but also quite a lot of the limitations and then we have like discussions about threats and opportunities around it so i'm kind of doing that as one of my gigs i guess i'm kind of one of those gig economy worker people who i don't really have a proper real full-time job I have all these random gigs and but just say i mean you are convinced that the metaverse is the future um it's the future of um certain industries like gaming and entertainment and those kind of things there's massive opportunity it's not the future of everything um but uh yes it's once we've got through the hype i can see potential future i spend maybe an hour and a half two hours a day in the metaverse at the moment <laughs> uh, and it is extremely exciting, and I'm quite I'm quite engaged with it, and addicted to some of the the metaverse things. So I see. You massive... already, sorry, can I ask? Were you already a computer game fan pre? I, yeah, so I was I was in my youth, uh, but I've gotten got back into. It. I bought I bought some virtual reality headset, you know, for my kids. But really, it was kind of for me uh, to yeah. to have a play in it. But uh, my daughter loves um, playing around in virtual reality. She actually. I caught her brushing her teeth in virtual reality. So I can't get her to brush her teeth in the real verse, but put her in virtual reality and there was a virtual toothbrush and she was, she's sitting there brushing her teeth in virtual reality. So like- So was yeah, she then, actually brushing her teeth at the same time in real in uh, IRL? In, uh, no. So she was, there was, it was a metaverse app called, uh, I think it was called Vacation Simulator, when you simulate going on holiday and doing all these things. And in one of the things, there was this bathroom and she was in there brushing her virtual teeth with virtual toothpaste. Uh, wow. I think the toothpaste was rainbow coloured. Let's see if she gets a virtual dentist. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So um, it's all a lot of fun, but there's some actual, there's some really good um, 
opportunity here. I think they were talking about a trillion dollar opportunity, but that's just a number that the people throw out there when they don't really have a, a way to quantify it properly. But it's going to be big and it probably will be now. I know we've been going on about virtual reality for maybe 20 years or so. And it's always like, you know, flying cars and moon bases. It's always just, you know, a couple of years out. But I think this time, um, virtual reality, aka the metaverse, uh, will be quite big. So I'm hoping to help educate people and, and guide them on that journey. All right. Well, let me ask a, a lawyer speaks. John, I, I hope that you have a healthy skepticism about the metaverse. No, I love the metaverse. Uh, I mean, as, as, as you might remember from the last time, Andrew, uh, you know, I... I uh, I spend most of my time doing dig digital stuff. Well, all my time doing digital stuff, but a lot in the in in the crypto space as well. So I, I you know, I was reading the JPM uh, report on the metaverse, Chris. I'm sure you've seen, but you know, I, I think it is really interesting, and it's really interesting to see the progression from things like Second Life to where we are now. Mm -hmm. um, but what am I doing? Uh, continuing to do lots of digital stuff. I mean, uh, two quick observations. I think what we're really seeing a lot of just in the last six months are just an explosion in work on nfts just an enormous amount and actually the number and diversity of legal issues that nfts bring is really interesting i mean much more than i would see any bit of the the kind of crypto or digital asset sphere it's very interesting and i think the second thing is we we see all of our big global banking clients really becoming moving into tech and all of the big our big global tech companies moving into financial services. And you could see, I mean, that's been predicted for a long time. And lots of people have said, well, that was, you know, why why would why would one say it good to do the other? But I think the way that business and the way that regulation is going, I think that it's sort of becoming an inevitability. Hmm. Okay. Well, look, um, I I again I roll my eyes as soon as I hear about NFTs. I just can't get my <laughs> <laughs> can't get my head around them, but you know, uh, where lawyers go, I suppose money will follow. So uh, let me ask uh, Jemima, what, um, what's, uh, what's on your mind at the moment? Well, what is on my mind? I mean, uh, uh, the metaverse is on my mind always. Unlike Chris, I do not spend two hours a day in the metaverse. In fact, I don't think I've ever been in the metaverse. Uh, but John's point about the kind of progression from Second Life to the metaverse is an interesting one, isn't it? Because one could argue that the metaverse is a new name for a quite old idea. Um, and I mean, it seems like the virtual reality part of all this is the bit that everyone's most excited about. But again, I mean, people have had virtual headsets for a while now, haven't they? So I'm, I'm, I'm a bit... It's uh, it's not like a sudden, I don't really believe that this is a sudden thing that's happening. I just believe that like people are suddenly, Facebook slash Meta is now trying to kind of jump on the bandwagon and so there's, you know, and there's NFTs, which are also a nice way of making some money. And so somehow there's like this new kind of narrative and new name, but really it's a kind of, um, it's not a sudden revolution, is it? Um, so has anyone- well, let, let, let me ask Chris, is it a sudden revolution? No, not at all. So yes, virtual reality, I remember putting on headsets like 20 years ago and you go to any video game arcade and play virtual reality games. It's not a new thing. Metaverse now, obviously the meta part came from the Facebook kind of branding, but now it's been sort of taken over as a as a umbrella term for virtual reality, augmented reality, web-free, NFTs, distributed autonomous organizations. They've kind of all come under this umbrella and that seems to be what people are calling the metaverse at the moment. Um, I would argue that that it was the other way around. I agree, but I think it's the other way around in that Facebook changed their name to Meta because of the Metaverse. Not the Metaverse isn't called the Metaverse because of Facebook. I think it's the other way around. But apart from that, I would, yeah. Let, let me ask. Let me ask all of you actually about the financial services and the Metaverse because when we were talking first about virtual re reality, we were talking about Barclays setting up in, you know, in Second Life, and you could, you could go and you could allegedly do banking transactions within the, uh, the virtual reality world. Um, what's happening now that's different? Um, so I went to um, JP Morgan yesterday or the day before, they'd set up their own sort of virtual bank branch in Decentraland, which is one of the newer metaverses. Um, and they've got this bank branch, it's about 500 square feet. There's like a space upstairs, downstairs. There's a tiger walking around for no apparent reason. 
and somebody's stuck PowerPoints to the wall. And it's all a little bit kind of gimmicky, but it's uh, it's got a lot of media attention, good and bad. Uh, but it shows that some of the big institutions sort of dipping their toe into this thing. But again, like you say, Barclays were doing that in Second Life a long time ago, right? I think the financial side of things is obviously there's a lot of money flying around, people buying virtual land, trading virtual items, and where a lot of money goes, then there's there's obviously space for financial services. And and what is uh, what are they actually offering? Um, so so JP Morgan in a bank branch is not offering a lot at all. You go in there and there's a, Just a get kind eaten of by a tiger. Yeah, you get eaten by a tiger and you can look at some PowerPoints on the wall, which aren't particularly interesting. They've kind of got um, but it's I guess that's just probably their innovation labs having a bit of fun. I think potentially um people are talking about insurance services for virtual items because a lot of these go for a lot of money and people are stealing them and robbing them and thieving them and losing them. Uh, so there's 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 scope for insurance services in those space. Um, yeah. And obviously things like NFTs, once we've evolved beyond silly monkey gifts and stuff, we can start looking at more practical uses like ticketing and, and digital ownership tokens and all sorts of other sort of more useful things after that. What's the ticketing? What's the ticketing? Sorry, I don't know about the ticketing uh, idea. What's the ticketing? Ticketing for what? So ticketing for anything, really. So at the moment, if you look at like the the board eight yacht club it's not just a gif of an ape right it's actually membership of a club um and you can start issuing nfts as uh, tickets as nfts and then trading those so tickets, if you've got, for what are the tickets for so this is it so at the moment it's an open space what we're seeing is that there's a way of attaching uh make having a container of value right and in that value it could be access to an event or it could be um exclusivity on a particular item it could be uh, there's all sorts of kind of ultimately could it evolve into a kind of a, a recommendation or a referral or a compliment or anything that has value that you can wrap up in a token and then kind of pass that on. John, John, you wanted to come in on that. Yeah, no, I, I was going to say, I mean, I think, you know, Chris is right, the insurance, but the other thing that obviously is going to be big is is lending, right? Using, you know, these properties that are worth something um, as assets for, for lending. And that's bound to become part of the, the financial services, you know, it, I mean, you'll have seen the news about it, you know, NFTs <laughs> being seized by HMRC, and it shows that even the tax authorities realise that these things have value. So, you know, it, it uh, there's a lot going on and staking lending, and that's bound to come into the metaverse as well. Back to you, Jemima. Well, the reason I was bringing up the metaverse is that everyone should watch, if they haven't already, the meta. Super Bowl ad. Well, I think we're going to come on to the Super Bowl a little a little bit later if we have time. But one of the ads played during the Super Bowl was this Meta ad, which I've only just watched. Um, I saw it like last night. Someone tweeted it. And it is truly, you know, you don't want to overuse these terms, but it is truly dystopian and truly horrifying. It's, <laughs> it's I, I might write a thing on it because I'm so... I, I, I'm actually, I'm, I'm starting to wonder, and I was wondering about contacting Meta, whether this is a kind of troll that they know that if they put out a really horrifying advert about what the metaverse will be, that that will just like attract attention. But it seems like a very odd technique. It seems like completely, it's, it's, it's like watching, and I, again, I'm not trying to like, it's easy to use hyperbole, but it is exactly like watching an episode of Black Mirror by written by Charlie Brooker. It, you, it, it's it's very similar to like the whole feeling is very similar to Black Mirror. It's almost like one of the so there's this animatronic dog who is in this who's like performing in this place and everyone's having a great time and then suddenly um, like or he's not an animatronic dog he's a kind of dressed up dog it's a bit unclear and then suddenly the, there's a power cut or something and everyone has to leave and all the lights go out. I'm a bit unclear about what's going on. And then this poor dog gets like, he's basically gets thrown on the scrap heap and he's never going to see his friends again. And it's incredibly sad. Um, and there's this 80s song, um, I've forgotten the name of it anyway. And um, I think something about when will I see you again? I've forgotten what song it is. And then at the end, he finally gets reunited with his friends in the metaverse. He's got this like virtual reality set. And it, I can't describe the horror of it. You have to just watch it. I think there's something. And they're selling what? So many levels of it. Well, the metaverse. So this is like, this is the future. You don't have to be with your friends in real life. 
you can just put on a headset and pretend to be with them. I mean, how sad is that? Truly <laughs> sad. It I mean, pretty... it would be good if it was, it would be good if it was like early lockdown and it was like, hey, look, there's like, but we're 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 precisely kind of coming into a time, perhaps kind of endemic, where like, you know, we can do things in real life again. And at the same time, this vision, this for like a future in which we don't have to be together in real life. It's crazy. It's, it's so it's 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 very interesting, but I don't know quite what to say about it yet. But I think okay, I recommend we move, everyone watching it. Maybe we should move on from the metaverse back to uh, back to planet Earth. Yes. Um, okay. So the first item on our list: uh, Does digitization post a threat to customer loyalty? This is a piece about. Um, it's about wealth management. So this is under the wealth management section. It's, a, it's about wealth management specifically, but I think it's quite interesting. It talks about how uh, digitization is no longer, you can no longer be like, hey, we've got this digital thing or we're digital and that's what makes us stand out. Um, that's kind of now an assumption and it's the kind of level of that of your digitization and the way that you use data in a kind of creative way, I guess, uh, is replacing, according to this article and since research, the kind of um, relationship with the client. But the question that it asks, does, does digitization pose a threat to customer loyalty? I think is an interesting one. I would argue that yes, it does. And in fact, it's something that I've been arguing for a while because I think uh, the, the kind of removal of frictions, which is, which is so good for the consumer um, in a kind of FinTech world is, is, is quite undermining for the companies because, uh, you know, the world of finance has historically relied on kind of, um, you know, apathy and people just staying with, and, and, and this loyalty, which is often fostered with this direct relationship with your bank manager, with, with a person. Um, and this is the digitization and the kind of removal of, of friction and the removal of any relationship with a person uh, removes this kind of moral uh, duty to kind of, you kind of, you, you know, the sense that you should stay loyal. I think that's quite an interesting um, idea and actually relatedly I got an email yesterday like a, just a you know a PR um, press release saying that following the um, uh, following the announcement from Nat West that they were closing 32 branches searches for cancel Nat West card on Google spiked by 900 percent um, and people are going to like trying to find you know Barclays or whatever so Clearly, there's still a desire for that, but um, for, for that kind of personal relationship. But it's an like, interesting one, the loyalty. Let me, just, let me offer, offer an alternative. I mean, it, particularly for the demographic in which I find myself, um, it is quite difficult to learn to navigate the digital world. So once you have learned to navigate the digital world for, for instance, in my case, RBS or whatever it is, you actually are stuck with it because oh, the last thing you want to do is go somewhere else and have to learn a whole nother system. Ah, that's really interesting. So you're so the clunkiness mm. they, they make, and I, and I often think that as well. Sometimes there's a deliberate ploy, isn't there, to make things sticky and to make things clunky, as you say, because otherwise it's quite hard. To well, work. I think for, for your generation, these things aren't clunky at all. You just zap oh. through it. But nonetheless, because a lot of the uh, assumptions that you make, which are absolutely you know, hardwired into you, into the way you live your life are not, in my generation, hardwired. We have to learn it. And yeah. that's, that's kind of t tricky. Can I ask whether you sh share uh, Jemima's view, John, first? Well, I definitely think that, I mean, it's, I can see where you're coming from, Jemima, but it's not necessarily a bad thing that customers are attracted to someone that's offering them good service. Mm, um, you know, and I think, it, I think it probably is. And I think, I can see, you know, I mean, a lot of this, a lot of fintech does hopefully offer more financial inclusion and a democratization of financial services, which I think, you know, many of us want, right? So, and I do, but I do think that what's ultimately going to matter to consumers is service, but it's also going to be brand. Brand's going to be important. But ultimately, I think a lot of it is about data. You know, it's if, if it's easy uh, to do and they know you've got your data because, and that was, you know, pre-open banking, the big, um, the big advantage that the big banks had, they had all your data, yeah. right? So you kind of felt, well, I don't want to use anybody else because they've got all my data and no one else can get access to it easily. And what open banking and what open finance will do, you know, if it, if it becomes a reality, 
will open up that data to others and and then it will be down to service and brand you know we we all get sucked into ecosystems because i mean i don't think i'm not sure it's just a generational thing andrew we all like our you know lives being easy you know that's, you get sucked into the apple ecosystem right because it's because mm -hmm. everything works yeah broadly you know um and you know the the stuff zaps across um the, yeah. the various bits of the ecosystem but i do think i think data and brand and service are ultimately going to be the important things maybe rather than personal loyalty because there isn't one person you're going to yeah hmm. yeah chris. chris um so for me there's two parts of this so one is around the api economy so as um, financial products and services open up uh, algorithmically their their front door then you'll start getting aggregated platforms so you can have an aggregated loan, for example, that's spread around various different loan providers and moves around on an almost daily basis. And in that sense, you know, it's almost like having a national grid for finances. Like I don't care where my money is any more than I care which power station is generating my, my electricity. I just turn on the light switch and it's there. So in that sense, loyalty is, is a race to the bottom. It's like algorithmic. It's who can provide the best, quickest response at the mm -hmm. best rate on a split second. And there's absolutely no loyalty there other than to uh, to an algorithm. Um, so that's kind of an interesting how the open banking API thing is going to survive in that in that kind of era, whether customer loyalty can survive that. But the other side I see is kind of customer engagement. And I think you've we've touched on that engagement with having a one-to-one -one relationship. And it's kind of interesting that banks and a lot of financial services feel that people want to do banking, like they want to get people logging onto the app like twice a week and doing lots of stuff and they get ever more clever widgets and gadgets for people to, to log in. But I think if you sort of grabbed any normal person off the street and said, do you want more or less banking in your life? Most people probably say kind of less banking. I'd rather it went away so I could kind of get on with more important things that matter to me. And what could happen with digital and certainly a lot of automation is that we get to the point where for a lot of us, financial services can be pushed into the background. Like, because I only really want to see like a a green light that says your finances are fine or an amber light saying something needs your attention or a red light saying you're into your overdraft and you're going to get some fees or something. And if, if, if we can automate stuff like that, then um, wh where's loyalty in any of that? Really, it's again, you're a slave to the algorithm or to, to a flashing light telling you need to do something. I haven't got any relationship other than it telling me that it works or not. So it'll be interesting again, whether customer loyalty will survive all that or like a lot of these things you'll come to full circle and uh, people get tired of having blinking lights telling them what to do at algorithmics deciding for them and they'll actually start craving having an actual real relationship with a real person again i mean can i ask uh, one question i mean has anybody done any work as a how what percentage of the capabilities uh, that are available on a digital platform a digital banking platform actually used by people I mean, you say there are lots, the, the, the companies put lots of new sexy widgets in there and so on and so forth. How many are, people actually use them? Hmm. I mean, am I, uh, I, 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 again, you know, this is my demographic speaking. We want, we want basic meat and potato stuff, but do you really, do you really use the, the facility? To, do you, Chris, use the facility to, to its limits? Um, so I don't use all the stuff, but interestingly, a lot of the more challenger banks, the new digital first banks are crowdsourcing their new features. They'll go out to their community and say, what would really help for you? So the crowd are the ones coming up with the idea and then the, then the bank builds it. And then if people aren't using it, then, you know, maybe they were, uh, you know, but at least they're, they're asking people, what do you want and building what they want? And I guess they, most companies, it costs a lot of money to maintain these things. So if they find that their widget or gadget that allows you to save for a holiday or save for whatever is not being used by the majority of people, I, I expect they'll sunset that and replace it with something else. I'd be quite curious about how many people, when we talk about crowd crowdsourcing it, you know, two 18-year-olds who are technically more gifted. Jemima, Jemima back to you. Um, I would say people do, you, you know, I would say that they're they're trying to do, those, those digital banks are trying to do everything you know, as cheaply as possible, hence their terrible customer service, a lot of them. And I would imagine that they would have an interest in only spending time and resources and, and money on creating things that people do want. So I would imagine they're quite successful at doing that. And in my experience personally of using these apps, they're pretty, they're pretty nice to use. Like I, I never have an issue with the actual, apart from the customer service, I never have an issue with the kind of user experience. I think places like, you know, Monzo and Revolut, et cetera, have, have certainly uh, improved the, the customer experience. It's just 
My, my issue is always, you know, whether they are going to, you know, be viable business models and apart from becoming kind of crypto trading shops. Um, but like, for example, budgeting, the budgeting kind of capability that Monzo has is like really has been widely copied. And I think people find very valuable. Um, and I mean, I personally don't just want this kind of amber, green, red light system that Chris talks about. I, I, I want personally, I want to be able to check on a quite regular basis how I'm kind of doing. So anyway, I will move on. Uh, Wealthtech FNZZ has secured 1.4 billion. This is kind of a continuation of what we've just been discussing. We don't need to spend very much time on it. It's just that they've raised 1.4 billion. Uh, sorry. Yeah, they've raised 1.4 billion, valuing themselves, valuing the company at more than 20 billion. Um, it's just this, this, uh, this, so it's a platform as a service. So it's a kind of um, wealth tech platform that other wealth management companies can then use kind of as in their, as their back end. Places like Vanguard use them. Apparently they've got over 650 financial institutions, um, assets under administration of over 1.5 trillion. Uh, which obviously is a bit of a, you know, it's a platform uh, that's working on behalf of others. So, so I think we can, uh, I mean, that just shows again. John, do you have any thoughts on that? Of the sector. I, I know FNZ incredibly well. I did my first deal opposite them for AXA. That was the second UK deal FNZ did, which was about 15, 16 years ago. Um, and I've done dozens of deals with them since then. Um, I mean, they are, you know, to go from, you know, they, 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 they came across from New Zealand with like one customer and then got Standard Life and AXA, you know, within the first couple of years. And they've done incredibly well and turned themselves into, a, you know, a major global operation and, and bought up companies. But, just, you know, and it's really interesting that they've, the success that they've had in that wealth management space, but they're, you know, they've got a real stranglehold on that bit of the market. Back to you, Jemima. Cool. Um, so... Is the next thing NFTs on everyone, everyone's list? Is that is it NFTs? Have I got that in the right order? Anyway, yeah. we've 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 discussed that a bit already. Um, this is a column by Tim Bradshaw in the in the FT, um, which I don't completely agree with everything that he says. I think he tends to be a bit more um, kind of positive, perhaps on tech, and I'm more of a luddite. Um, uh, so it's about the fact, as he puts it, um, the NFT market is still in its early days. I would argue, I mean, it's a tricky one. In some ways it is. In some ways you could say it might be late. I mean, it might just be a very short lived kind of thing. Um, I mean, maybe not because crypto is obviously still going. I don't know. It's, it's, it's a piece set talking about how um, essentially, even though there's a lot of money in the NFT market, there's not a huge number of people involved yet. And he compares this to the early days of Twitter, where everyone knew what Twitter was, but people weren't necessarily using Twitter. Um, I would say it's more like people know what kind of GameStop is, GameStop is, but, but you know, only a certain number of people actually bought into it, or not everyone knows what GameStop is. But I guess I would see it as more of a kind of, you know, people know that people are involved in gambling or investing. And just because, you know, not, not everyone is involved in it doesn't mean that they will become involved in it in the future. And he's not he's not claiming that either, but he's kind of saying, look, there's there's there's, there's potentially a huge, you know, five billion active, you know, internet users around the world. But I just don't really personally buy into the whole idea of an NFT. So I can't really. I mean, I can see that it's potentially still early days in the sense that with crypto, as I say, like hype can continue going for a long time. At what point is something no longer a bubble if like if it keeps going without bursting? You know, it's, an, it's a kind of valid question, I think, to ask whether something is still a bubble when it's been carrying on for quite so long. But I still consider NFTs part of that. Well, John, both John and Chris are, I, I think, um, committed enthusiasts. Um, John first. Yeah, I mean, I, I I think NFTs, I mean, Chris said this already, but and I completely agree with him. I think we're seeing, it, it's like the start of the internet that I went went through, you know, as a lawyer. And, you know, you, you see use cases that people are driving, but that's just the start of the adoption. And I think it's a lot of NFTs are taking existing products and services and using a token to allow a different type of access 
um, you know, to art, to, um, you know, to, to, to movie clip, to, you know, sports clips or trading, uh, sports trading cards or those sorts of things. But it's a future that's really interesting. You know, you can, an NFT can be linked to basically anything, you know, and that's where, you know, when it starts linking to items of property, items of other inter items of intellectual property. So I, I think it's, I think it's really interesting and really exciting. And I, I do, you know, it, it, we're at the start of it. Where, where, I would, let me ask you, where do you think it will be in five years? Well, whether we'll we'll call them NFTs or whether we'll, you know, there'll probably be some other name for them. But this is, you know, this is this is the start of another wave of tokenization of a different type of, of asset, Andrew. So I think there'll be there'll be a lot more of these and they'll be in a much, you know, a much broader spread of um of linked uh, products and services and um properties. Chris, give me give me a, a use case five years in the future for NFTs. Um, so, for example, like um, I did a bit of research recently on homeless charities in London and uh, giving money to homeless people. Um, the money's dropped off. Same homeless buskers because it's a ca no longer cash, and they don't take cards, obviously. Um, so, um, and people don't really want to give cash because they're they're a bit concerned about misuse of money by homeless people. Might put it to drugs or something. Uh, but what you could potentially do is have NFTs representing a, a hot shower, hot meal, a night in a hostel, something like that, that you could potentially buy off um, a homeless charity and then gift to homeless people if they were given a, you know, a plastic QR code or something like that. Um, There's so literally no, sorry, sorry. I mean, like, I hear you, but I've just got to, I've just got to push back. There's literally no reason to do that via an NFT. Like, why would you do that via an NFT? Um, that's a great, I mean, I'm, I'm totally like, that sounds like a great idea in terms of giving them you know, uh, vouchers, but why not just give them a digital voucher? There's, I mean, is there any need whatsoever to make it an NFT? Yeah, it's a very good point. A lot of the NFT stuff doesn't necessarily have to be an NFT. I guess in this thing, if you had a digital voucher scheme, digital vouchers <laughs> tend to be closed ecosystems, vouchers, coupons, air miles tend to be a walled garden. If you had a um, an NFT system on an open platform, then you could have these interchangeable and I could send uh, this to wherever I want to go to a different channel. And they could trade it for drugs. Uh, well, the yeah, whole point was to not, not make yeah. it. Into obviously, I mean, there's, the there's a way is, around this, yeah. And I, I wonder how many of these, you know, monkey NFT things bouncing about are are legitimately people who have a, a genuine interest in monkey art and how many of them are to do with <laughs> money laundering and, uh, and counterterrorism financing and, uh, and all sorts of other... Uh, dodgy activities so yes there, there's always open to abuse on these things and you know the thing I find the thing I find interesting is that like Andrew asked you know what's a what's a use case and whenever people answer that question it is just <laughs> I just I just never hear I never get a, I, I don't you just said it doesn't have to be an NFT and I just don't maybe my mind just is limited here but I just never and, and and the idea that John was talking about this being the early internet, I mean, this is a very, you know, we've heard this a lot for the past. I mean, I've been writing about Bitcoin since 2015, and I've heard this phrase since a lot since then. And we're now seven years into this, and now NFTs are the new internet. And back then it was Bitcoin was the new internet, and then it was blockchain was the new internet, and then it was, you know, ICOs, and then it's the metaverse. And it's like, in some ways, yeah, it is the new internet in the sense that this was the, this is the, in the sense of the dot com kind of, boom and then subsequent crash like the 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 crypto bowl the super bowl was named the crypto bowl in 2000 it was named the dot com bowl and um you know people like pets.com were were spending the big money and then they crashed so again and i don't want to call this the top you know because it's it's very unwise to call the peak in this in this market but um yeah just had to uh, express a little bit of okay after yeah. that little mini rant let's move on down yeah. your list uh, so the next thing is NFTs and Andreessen and Horowitz, sorry, Board Ape um, NFTs. So this company that that has kind of uh, is quite secretive um, company that's that's launched all of this, um, which is called Yuga, whose founders. I'm just trying to find them. Oh yeah, so, so founders are called Gordon Gona, Emperor Tomato Ketchup, 
no sass and gargamel very good founder names um they did not respond to multiple requests for comment for this piece but basically <laughs> uh they are apparently uh, reportedly in talks with andreessen horowitz which is this big uh, vc silicon valley vc that's invested in all sorts of tele- uh, silicon valley startups um like airbnb um uh what are the other ones that is anyway lots and lots of lots and lots of silicon valley startups but it also has invested in coinbase so it's already got a kind of interest in crypto and this kind of world um and apparently they're in talks which is not particularly surprising they're also they also have a um they're also a shareholder in OpenSea, which is this nft exchange so it's a kind of natural kind of progression i guess that they would be interested in this company so these are the, these are the board eight yacht club nfts that people like gwyneth paltrow um have bought and Snoop Dogg. Um, so I don't know how much more there is to say on that. Um, uh, but of course, an exchange talk? is a way of making money, even if uh, even if what you're exchanging is a bubble. Uh, Absolutely. And my goodness, do they make a lot of... I mean, Coinbase, Coinbase is... Um, I think their Q... One of their quarters last year, they made one... I think it was Q2 or Q, Q3, they made 1.4 billion in profits mm. which is um a lot of money isn't it and these these super bowl ads that they were paying for so i don't know if um if you guys saw this but they so they did this qr coinbase put yeah. up this qr code and then it ended up being a um a qr code to take you to the coinbase website but basically the the website crashed because like 20 million people tried to do it um but it cost them 14 million dollars um, but they were charging $7 million per half per 30 seconds, CNBC, no, NBC, whoever the, the network was, which is apparently the, the highest amount ever, which is not surprising. Um, and, you know, it's very small fry for these companies, isn't it? 14 million when you're making 1.2 billion in a quarter, um, definitely worth it for them. I think we're seeing now the kind of, it was the same with the Matt Damon crypto.com ad. They also, one of these um, companies had Larry David, I don't know if you saw that, the Larry David ad. That was yeah. really, for yeah. those of us who were fans of Larry David, it was a little uh, disappointing that he would <laughs> do a crypto anyway. ad. But anyway. Um, it Prince Andrew. Let it me, was quite, uh, a, let good, me was quite ask, a good ad, but sorry. Let me just ask John, I mean, a, a, a last a last word on 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 the NFL, uh, sorry, not the NFL, NFT. Uh, crypto well, it is era. NFL and NFT, yeah. Yeah. Uh, just... You know, you, you you really believe there is a, a, a business case. It's not just a, a question of technology. It's, there's a business case behind it. Well, there is. I mean, there's there there is a you know the the reason Google make 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 a lot more than one point four billion in profit. You know, and most of their you know and they, they you know most of that is made from from one thing, which is search, right? I mean, just you know, the, it, there is a this is this is a I agree with you, Jemima, this is another uh, bit of the cycle, but the internet took a long time to develop as well. You know, I <laughs> yeah, think but, people, people forget that, right? Keep, we can't just keep coming back to like, you can't just choose the biggest, you know, one of the biggest companies in the world, most profitable companies in the world and say, well, look, that took a while too. I mean, yes, but it doesn't mean that the NFTs and crypto are therefore going in the same direction. I don't really see the... Okay, well, let's I'm, move Let's move on. We've only got, we've only got, we're, we've got a hard stop, so... I mean, I'm interested. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm. I know people think that I'm closed-minded, but I am genuinely open-minded. But I just, um, I'm interested in hearing the arguments for why. But I'm not. I'm still. Uh, I don't. Coinbase, hear them. Coinbase, Coinbase are equally the biggest yeah. exchange in the world, right? So you know, yeah. we could pick. We could pick any other exchange. You well, know, finance is finance. I think it might be bigger, but but yeah. Anyway, well, what do you mean? But no, but I'm not saying that. No, but I'm. Why does that? I'm not saying that that Coinbase is the biggest, and therefore. I don't understand that that point. But, but, but what I'm saying is, why is this? I understand that you've got clients who you know who who are interested in this stuff. But why? Why? Why is this the new internet? Like, what is the internet? The internet actually fulfilled a need. Right. What's NFT? the need? What is the need? That is a really good point. What is the need? I think it took us a long time to figure out the need for the internet. Is that's true? Yeah. That's my point. So um, and. And I, I think we are still not through that cycle. You know, wow. I mean, you know, so I, uh, 
and I and I and I see um, utility in, in in lots of what digital assets have to offer. Okay. Um, okay. Move on. Fair enough. Um, so I, maybe I'll just skew over the next story, yeah. just about buying a home in the metaverse. I think we've we've done quite a lot on the metaverse and NFTs. Um, so digital currencies. This is a guest um, column in the FT by Ezwar Prasad, who's a Cornell professor and a senior fellow at Brookings, talking about some He's of the a rather good book. Incidentally, we did an interview with him. It's oh, really? What's yeah. the book? What's the book on? That I can't remember the name. Right. Of. <laughs> look, look him up on it. He's on. Yeah. Um, oh, sorry, it's called The Future of Money, his book. Yeah. So he actually says it on, on the column. Um, so, so there's the, an interesting exploration of that. Um, he's talking about, for example, the way in which, so digital, digital currency, I think we need to kind of separate from, uh, you know, crypto. It's all, it's all kind of often lumped in together, isn't it? And clearly cryptocurrency has has acted as a catalyst to um innovation i mean the innovation might have happened anyway but i think there's 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 been increased interest and increased um um importance placed on on developing digital currencies particularly um given that you know kind of crypto and stable coins and you know these private digital currencies are seen as a kind of threat in some ways to um you know central bank's ability to um to uh, you know, to use monetary policy to to control the economy, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, so this 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 article is make, making some interesting points. One of which is that um, the work that the China what's it called the China China's cross border interbank payment system, yeah, which the I digital think, the digital yuan, yeah, yeah, which I think they they've been working on since about 2015. That this will allow, because um, so so essentially, you know, the, the the dollar obviously has has been incredibly dominant for a long time. Emerging markets transactions kind of have to go via the dollar, and so that's one of the things that gives the dollar this this dominance. Um, that is no longer going to have to be the case, and therefore the dollar is going to lose its dominance. And so this is talking about some of the implications of that. You know, the U.S. ability, America's ability to impose sanctions is one of the big um, potential potential negative or, or positive, uh, whatever side of that you stand on, uh, implications of the dollar losing its dominance. Um, so there's kind of big kind of geopolitical implications of this. But it also, the column also talks about the way in which if the dollar, if a, if a digital, well, it, it also says that this could potentially make the dollar more important in some ways, because if 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 um if a digital dollar, either a stable coin or a kind of central bank digital dollar becomes a much more kind of easy way to pay for things, then that will become the dominant thing in emerging economies as well. And that they will therefore be, you know, too dependent on on the US's monetary policy and kind of at the whim of the Fed, blah blah blah, and that um, and that that could also exacerbate um, economic inequality right. between the countries. So there's a, there's, me, a, there's a various let, points being made. Let me ask John on that. I mean, you're you're again uh, enthusiastic about central bank digital cash. And, um, yeah, I mean, I think that you know there are concerns about the china cbdc project because of the privacy concerns but you know it's it's very interesting we have talked to some some of our bank clients about it and what the you know central bank of china are, are are doing is is you know getting to getting other banks to hook into their system so if chris or i were were traveling to china you know we would be able to download digital one on our on our and you you know and, and you'd be encouraged to use it as a tourist so i mean I think it's a good thing, um, and it's an interesting thing. I think there are privacy concerns. I think you know other countries in the world are definitely looking at this, and I do actually think that CBDCs will be the future in in many other jurisdictions. And I think there will be a catch up. I don't think any jurisdiction is in the same hurry that China is, and China has its own reasons for doing it. But um, and actually, personally, I I could see CBDCs taking over from stable coins except with you know there'll be there'll be some people that always want to use stable coins because they don't like the idea of using mm -hmm. a, a, a cbdc but i think most most of us will end up using some sort of digital currency and again how different really is that from yeah, what we're kind of used to i mean i think most people it, it, make, most yeah. central bankers make the point that what something like 95 percent of transactions are already 
digital. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. probably yeah. it probably wouldn't it feel digital. yeah. It wouldn't um, feel different. There is a real, there's a real issue as to whether you disintermediate the banks. Mm. You know, if you can deal directly with the central bank, why do you need to deal with an intermediary? And that these intermediaries have big lobbying power. So, you know, they will, they will be kept in the loop. Can you just that, move that's on? The importance of, that's the importance of infrastructure, Andrew, and making those decisions as central bank as to how, how you hook in the banks or the fintechs or whatever. So, and those are quite, those are big decisions that will have implications on the industry yeah. for sure. But, Buy now, pay later. Buy now, pay later. Um, this is a kind of continuing a theme that, that's, that's been kind of chugging away, particularly since the early days of the pandemic a couple of years ago when buy now, pay later really started to take off in a, in a big way, I would, I, I would say. Um, so um, Klarna has now launched its first physical card, um, pastel pink and black card, which enables customers to uh, delay their payments for 30 days. So in many ways, Quite similar to a credit card, so that now they can now they can use this to pay at any retailer, not just the many many retailers that have kind of signed up to be part of to be part of the planners kind of customer base. Um, so that's a kind of interesting development. Uh, they argue that they're actually a lot more ethical than credit cards. Their charges are a lot lower. They give people warnings about. Um, about you know when their payments are due, um, some of them don't even charge late payment um, fees. But it's an interesting one because I think that's a valid argument. To be fair, from the from the buy now pay later, I've said this before. Like I use Klarna and have never paid a late payment fee just because they make it so incredibly um, hard to to forget. They give you so many kind of warnings. Um, but so it's a kind of interesting thing because yes, they are doing things in a way that's 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 probably better than some of the credit cards and some of the you know payday loan companies and all of the kind of those sharks of the past. But also the market that they're that they are catering to is just enormous. And I mean, I, I wonder what proportion of kind of 18 to 30 year olds or whatever, you know, use I, I would say it's a huge, huge majority. I would, I would imagine using this and the, the market is just swelling every year um so it's an interesting so it's, and, and the fca have started to, they've got a consultation this year they've started kind of putting you know uh, throwing their weight around a bit they they have um they've they've brought in laws for kind of advertising um they need you know these buy now pay later companies need to make sure that they're telling customers is a type of debt um, Klarna obviously. Wait, how many companies that, are there in this market now? Klarna is the market leader, but are yeah. there, as it were, less ethical uh, companies muscling Interesting. in? Interesting. Yeah, I don't know whether there are. I, I haven't kind of looked into it enough to know whether. Oh, yeah, you know, there's some really unethical ones. I don't get the impression there are because they're all having to be. They're all having to kind of live up to the same standard. And yes, there are there are lots of companies. There are four in particular that the um, FCA has addressed. In its um, in its advice, these are big ones. The UK it's Clearpay, Klarna, Layby, and OpenPay. But then there are companies like you know Monzo and Revolut uh, are bringing in pay, lap, pay buy, buy now pay later um, capabilities. Uh, Amazon and Barclays have got a thing called installments that you can use if you've got a Barclay card on Amazon on, on payments of over hundred pounds. So kind of everyone's entering uh, the market, um, and it's a good question. I don't know if there are any really unethical ones, but um, Klarna is so dominant, or these other ones are so dominant that there wouldn't be a particular reason at the moment that I can see for going. Let, to me, ask, let me ask Chris, I mean, who is uh, of that particular age group. Do you use Klarna? I don't, I haven't used Klarna, but I have used Buy Now Pay Later. There's a lot of the big players, like if you look at PayPal, they've got their pay in free thing. Mm. Uh, on the checkout, you can spread the payment, right? And like you yeah. said, Barclays are partnering with Amazon, they're partnering with Apple Store now. So yeah. if you're a big laptop on Apple Store, you can spread it out, right? So it's a pretty common uh, mechanism. I see it. Um, ultimately devolving back into credit cards mm -hmm. i think we're we are getting so many little fragments of credit all over the place so buy now pay later mm -hmm. ultimately you get back to the platform argument that says actually wouldn't it be great if we had one single credit account spanning all these things and wouldn't it be great if we had one single card to manage it all and a number to enter into any online or offline way to, and, and eventually you devolve back into into credit cards but hopefully solving some of the uh, mm -hmm. nasty practices of the credit card industry in the in the process uh, like we talk about overpayment fees and all these kind of things so hopefully that's the the way it's going to go and that's the way I'm predicting it's going to go it's ultimately going to end up looking a lot like credit cards but probably a lot more usable okay we've only got two minutes I'm going to ask John Chris and then uh, finally Jemima just to say 
what have we what what do you think we've missed john so the one big thing and we kind of exchange emails on this yesterday is the SEHMT proposal on crypto assets promotions which i have to say is probably one of the worst proposals i've seen for a long time um so which is a pretty low bar um but <laughs> you know basically uh, like, you know, I won't go into details because we don't have time, but someone put it in a, a much better than I could in a, in a session I was in yesterday saying, this is a bit like saying to fintechs 10 years ago that you'd have to get a bank to sign off on all your promotions because that's what it's asking you to do. So crypto companies, even though they're regulated to do what they're, what they're, what they're doing, will not be able to sign off on their own promotions. We'll need to go to an investment firm effectively to get their promotion signed off, which is crazy. It's also very ludicrously complicated, the whole process. But so it's a and bad, the timing, bad thing. The, the timing on, on this proposal, I mean, it's out for consultation at the present time. So this is the response to the consultation from HMT. So HMT are now saying they're doing it. Uh, the FCA are out for consultation, Andrew. So expectation is probably another six months for that bit of the consultation. There also needs to be legislation put in place. So parliamentary time needs to be done and there's going to be a six month transition period. So you're probably looking at a year before this goes in, but I just don't see the sense in putting under, you know, putting financial promotions rules for regulated assets for effectively unregulated assets. So and it shows to me why we need a bespoke regime for crypto in the UK. You know, I, I don't disagree that there's bad behavior and, you know, uh, but there are ways of doing this more sensibly. Chris? I think in our discussion about central bank digital currencies, we, yes, we talked about uh, the privacy um, uh, or lack of privacy with central bank digital currencies, but I think we need to look a bit further into potential financial censorship. Mm -hmm. So once you have essentially programmable money, then you can start having state putting restrictions on how, when, and where you spend your money. Mm -hmm. And it starts out with good intentions, like, oh, we've got an obesity pandemic, so we better limit how much fast food somebody could buy in a given week or we should put caps on how much whether you can gamble percent of your income pretty soon it turns into people who are enemies of the state can't travel or buy train tickets or visit venues or access things and services yeah. so i think freedom of commerce will be as big as freedom of speech mm -hmm. in the yeah. next decade totally agree Chris. Sorry, great point yeah, yeah freedom of commerce that's a really interesting phrase that we will hear more of the final word jemima is with you I agree. That is very interesting. I like it. Um, well, actually, on, on the back of what John just said, it's interesting because Matt Hancock, who I'm writing about today, um, who's, uh, well, it's difficult to say anything without um, the... the Anyway, I, I'm, I'm, I need to not get myself into trouble. But basically, he has a very different take from uh, the FCA and the, the HMT, I think. Um, he, his view is that we should, we should make the regulation extremely comfortable for cryptocurrency and fintech companies, and that, and that furthermore, Britain should be the home of crypto. So I, I, that's all I'll say on that uh, today. Work for El Salvador, it should work for us. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Can I thank, uh, we have a hard stop, we've got to finish. Can I thank John, John Salmon? Can I thank Chris, Chris Bredhill and Jemima Kelly, as always, and you for watching. Many thanks.